Notebook 13. The Somme Offensive. From the 29th of August, 1916, to the 1st of November, 1916. Part 1. On the last episode, we saw how life for Barthas and the other Palus on the Champagne sector, which, compared to others, had been quite peaceful, came to an end. The division was relieved, and the men did not doubt that soon General Henri Gouraud's promise that they would have their turn in the meat grinder of the Somme would be fulfilled. But, for the moment, they were sent to the village of Letré, a village of twenty-eight inhabitants that would now have to house a battalion of over a thousand men. Here, the officers put them again through training for open field warfare and we shall now see what happened there. Soon after their arrival, Captain Adjutant Major Croix Mayreville went away on home leave, and Lieutenant Grulois, the man who back in the Champagne sector had killed the German sentry at Outpost 9 in cold blood, took over command of Barthas's company. Barthas wrote that there were more injustices punishments, and abuses of power than he could ever write down, and that Lieutenant Grulois would have been an ideal commander for a gang of chain convicts. Under his command, no one dared to laugh or speak freely, and no one dared to rest or even lie down outside of appointed hours, because Grulois would constantly prowl through the ranks in search of the slightest breach in rules and of the slightest incorrect comment. He would also carry out frequent, unscheduled, and random roll calls and assemblies to the point that no one dared to wander fifty meters away from camp. The daily reading of orders took more than an hour, and if the lieutenant heard a single whisper, he would make the company form a square around the guilty party, and have him repeat out loud what he'd said and if the man stayed silent, then the whole company was punished and given extra work details. During the random inspections which could involve anything and everything, the lieutenant would check each and every single item personally and deal out punishments accordingly. Near their camp in Letre, there were a few decently sized villages which the Polus might have liked to go to during their free time but authorizations to go there were exceedingly difficult to get. Still, Barthas wrote that one day he made a little trip to a nearby town called Boussy. The only interesting thing there were the Russian interpreters, who were little more than Frenchmen that had the unhoped-for good luck of being able to speak Russian, and so had been promoted to officers within a day and now waited in the village for whenever the Russian forces in the region needed their services. Later, on the 1st of September, a 37 mm cannon team was formed, and, due to his previous training, Barthas became part of it and was assigned to the 4th Machine Gun Company. He wrote that it was with a heavy heart that he had to leave behind his squad of juvenile delinquents, to whom he had become very attached, but that, at least, he didn't leave them altogether, as they were still in the same battalion. On the 4th of September, the battalion left Letre, and, after a hard march, the Poulous were billeted in a town called trois le grand which was separated by a river from the village of trois le petit and which was also near the Meili camp, the place where the Russians of the expeditionary force were stationed at that time. At trois le petit one could see the traces of a battle that had taken place in 1914. Training and field exercises resumed the very next day after their arrival, but Barthas wrote that as part of the 37 millimeter cannon team, things suddenly became so much easier he could barely believe his luck. There were no more roll calls or parades, and the field exercises consisted of little more than short maneuvers with the cannon, and a few breaks to talk about theory. 
The Canon team found that their new life consisted of little more than nice strolls through the countryside and naps in the shade. Barthas wrote that it was important to mention that their new commanding officer was a completely different man from the hated Grulois. This officer treated them like comrades and spared them many work details, dangers, and periods of boredom. Barthas wrote that the only flaw the man had, and it is impossible to find a human without one, was that sometimes, if he detected too strong a smell of alcohol on a soldier, he could become quite angry. But still, if he ever lashed out at someone, he was the first to recognize and apologize for his mistake. This man was Sub-Lieutenant Loriot, the one who one night had crawled drunk through the wire of Outpost 10, had almost been killed by the grenade of one of Barthas's sentries, and had to be misdirected to avoid his attacking the nearby Germans. Barthas wrote that the sub-lieutenant never mentioned that incident ever again, and so he did the same. Loriot had been an oncom from an artillery regiment, who had been tempted into the infantry through a promotion to officer, and he was a good superior to his men. During those days, Colonel Robert enforced an extremely intense training regime across the regiment, which was carried out every day from dawn to dusk. The soldiers returned exhausted and commented that it made them miss the trenches, which was saying a lot. Additionally, nearby, the Polus could hear the songs and prayers that were performed by the Russians at their camp. The Russians would assemble as if for an inspection and sing in unison. And the strange spectacle astonished Martha's and the other soldiers and several of them went over to observe it curiously. And so they spent their days. Finally, on the 14th of September, and to his great joy, Barthas received his second home leave, over seven months after the first one. He went by train, and on the night of the 16th to the 17th, he had the great joy of seeing his loved ones once again, and forgetting the horrible life of the trenches for a few short days. On the 24th, he once again had to head back to the front. He went to take a tram from the village of Tros, three kilometers away from his hometown. He was only accompanied by his wife, as his little children were very anxious of kissing him goodbye at the station, and had preferred to do so at home. From the station he could see his relatives hard at work, harvesting a nearby patch of grapevines. He wondered if the war would be over by next year, so that he could return and lend a hand to his old father in this difficult task. As he looked around at this land of grapevines, he could see the grape pickers. All were gloomy and silent, and there were only children, women and old men. He wondered when the joy and laughter of young people would return to the fields, and departed with a heavy heart, having to leave behind the ones that loved him unconditionally, back to the cruelty and indifference of war. At dawn the next day, he arrived at Orléans. A few minutes later, he took a train to Champagne that was so crowded that he had to scramble up to a lookout post. At 5 p.m., he, together with other leave-takers from his regiment, got off at the mustering station of Gézin. Here they were told that the regiment had left for the Somme. It seemed the general's promise was becoming reality. With this, Barthas and the other soldiers again had to get onto the trains at 8 p.m. The journey was long, but no one complained. It was that much extra time outside of the front lines. Twenty-four hours later, Barthas got off at the city of Amiens. It was 9 p.m. and he had to make his way to a station to wait for a train that was supposed to leave at 7 a.m. the next day. He was surprised to see that the station was called Saint-Roche. Saint-Roche was an important saint in his homeland, 
There were even relics of his in the village where Barthas had taken the tramway. He simply prayed to the saint that he did not catch a nasty cold in the chilly evening, and went to look for a place to rest. The station and the sidewalks around it were full with hundreds of leave-takers that were lying down completely exhausted from their long journeys. Barthas did the same. Next to him were some young Belgian men that were waiting for the same train as him. They had escaped their country when it had been invaded by the German army in 1914, and now, having just turned twenty years old, they had been conscripted into the army. Barthas wrote that he and all the others would have liked to have something better as a bed than the hard sidewalk, but no one complained, since it wouldn't have changed anything. The next morning, Barthas took the train, he got off at the station of Namp, and, after walking ten kilometers, he finally rejoined his regiment at a village called Tiloil Conti. As the regiment would soon enter and take part in the Somme offensive, the Poulous were put on an intensive training program. The exercises went from morning to evening, and they were all for open field warfare as if the generals could not see the brutal stalemate of the battle. On the 6th of October, the police had to get on two trucks and were sent in the direction of the front line. But it seemed it would still be some time before it was their turn to enter the trenches, as the trucks stopped and dropped them off at a village called Hamlet. At the entrance to the village, the police saw a column of German prisoners and some of the more cynical soldiers said that they must have intentionally been placed there to encourage the regiment. Every evening from that village, the soldiers could see the terrible spectacle of the Somme. Countless flashes from explosions and the fiery streaks of flares illuminated the night sky, together with smoke and the continuous, deafening rumbling from hundreds and thousands of explosions. It was like an erupting volcano, like a living painting of hell. The veterans of the regiment looked at it full of worry. It's just like Verdun, they said, only colder and with more rain and mud. Meanwhile, the poor rookies were completely terrified at this horrible manifestation of war. On the 9th of October, after eating breakfast, they were sent into that place, leaving the village of Hamle to a lively polka played by the regimental band. Their path went through the valley of the Somme. The terrain was irregular and several parts had been covered by overflowing marshlands, so the going was difficult. By nightfall they arrived at an enormous camp and were put into barracks where they had to sleep on the hard, damp ground. This was the Bonfray farm camp, and it was truly huge. There were few barracks, but there were all kinds of shelters made with tent cloths, planks, broken crates, tree branches, and any other available materials, together with some very nice cabins, which were meant only for English officers. The place was so large and covered such a large area that one couldn't see its edge. Here there were thousands of English recruits, and through its roads one saw innumerable convoys of trucks, cars, wagons, ambulances, and infantry columns. Warehouses were full with foodstuffs, ammunition, and all kinds of materials, while railway lines had been put down and constantly brought in more tons of all kinds of goods. The camp never stopped buzzing with activity, and on the background of its dizzying cacophony, one could hear the constant rumble of the Somme. And near the Palouse barracks there were monstrous English artillery pieces on rails and platforms that occasionally fired 100 kilogram shells at the German positions. The Palouse stayed in that camp until the 19th of October all the while being trained in new methods and tactics for the fight ahead. 
intense rains soon turned the camp into a muddy mess, and the Palus could constantly see regiments returning from the front lines in a pitiful state. Barthas and the other Palus heard the chilling tales of the soldiers who came back from the trenches, and who, despite all their suffering, still had the strength to smile. The Palus were extremely nervous about their departure, and more than once they were scared by false alarms. To try and keep up morale, the regimental band constantly played energetic mazurkas and waltzes right in the middle of their camp, which at least helped a bit in distracting from the constant cannonade of the Somme. Barthas wrote of how their higher-ups couldn't understand how men that had been free right before the war began could submit themselves to being sent to its senseless slaughter without the slightest commotion. He wrote that in part it was men not wishing to be seen as cowards by their comrades. In part it was men believing that they were special and fate would spare them death and wounding. For some... It was the futile ambition for a medal or a promotion, and for most, it was simply seeing that it was pointless to resist against such an unstoppable fate. Still, their distant superiors couldn't understand it, and revolt of the ranks was their greatest fear, so they carried out ridiculous attempts at deceiving the soldiers. One morning, they came up with a particularly stupid and cruel ruse. A note was read to the regiment that announced that they had been sent here simply to build up the sector at night in preparation for its occupation by the English, and so they wouldn't be sent to the front lines. At this the Palouse breathed a sigh of relief, but on the next day came the second act of this comedy. The Palouse were told that a group of young officers had been humiliated by this decision, seeing it as a lack of confidence in the regiment, and so had sent a plea to the general demanding that the regiment be granted the honor of being sent into battle together with the rest of the division. The third day came the final act, as it was announced that before such loud protests from the regiment, the general had granted them the honor of going into battle to face the German machine guns and cannons. It was all a ridiculous and insulting trick, and so the Palouse would be sent to the front line. On the 18th of October, the perpetual bombardment of the Somme reached an up to that point unseen level of violence. A cold storm broke out, and the Palouse were told to get ready to depart at any moment. But it wasn't until one in the afternoon of the following day that they left the camp for the front lines under a strong rain. They passed a half-destroyed village called Mahiku. Its only inhabitants were territorials that lived in its cellars and that watched the soldiers march by with indifference. They had seen plenty infantry columns pass that place over the last four months. Then the Palouse passed the village of Hardecourt, Few even noticed that there was a village here, as the place had been completely devastated by artillery. There was hardly one stone left standing, and only a few pieces of foundations managed to stick out of the mud. A kilometer later, the road descended into a ravine. At the bottom of the ravine, there was a narrow-gauge railway track, through which at night trains would bring up tons of shells for the artillery. Here there was also a place called the Morepa Station, named for a nearby village which, much like Hardecourt, no longer had a single house standing. At this point, the Palus entered the range of enemy artillery, and so they had to stop following the road, which could only be used at night, and follow the tracks along the bottom of the ravine. This place seemed to have been witness to intense fighting, as there were many shattered trees pulled out of their roots, broken rifles, grenades, and German shells scattered all around. Still, the Palouse marched on under the rain. 
by nightfall they finally stopped at a bend in the ravine about two kilometers from their objective. Their superiors granted them two hours of rest before beginning the hard climb. At around 7 p.m. the rain stopped. The young rookies from Barthas's former squad went up to greet him before they all went to the front lines. Maurice Hiver, the young Breton, gave Bartha some coins to pay back two francs that Barthas had borrowed him. It's in case I'm killed so that we're even, he said. Barthas tried to refuse, saying that he did not care about forty sous, but Hiver insisted and later left with the other youngsters. It was the last time Barthas ever saw him. Then the rest was over and the march was resumed. For Barthas and the other five members of his gun team, the going became much more difficult. Up to that point, the gun teams had had mules to transport their 37 millimeter cannons, but now they had to leave the animals behind. The gun was disassembled into two parts that each weighed 40 kilograms and had to be carried individually. They had to take turns carrying the heavy pieces over the difficult terrain in darkness while following the rest of the machine gun company. After five hours of hard marching, they reached the town of Comble, near their objective. There were a few husks of houses still standing, but every day German shells rained over it. The police had to leave the town behind and go into the fields, following a road that was little more than a ditch dug by shellfire and full of mud, though at least it offered some cover. But soon the road disappeared and they had to walk through the plains, following a snaking path that went around large and flooded shell holes. With all these efforts, the gun team was reaching the end of its strength. The men that carried the two cannon parts had to be relieved every one or two minutes, and occasionally one of the men would slip and fall into the mud, and, crushed by the weight of the gun, could only get back onto his feet with the help of the rest of the team. Luton and Loriot worried over them and marched with them, begging and pleading for them not to stop, as the machine gunners that they had to follow occasionally disappeared in the darkness ahead of them. More than once, the sub-lieutenant would go ahead and plead to the officers of the machine gun company to slow their pace so as not to leave them behind. Finally, they reached a sunken piece of ground. They couldn't tell whether it was a sunken road or a stream bed, the bottom was flooded with liquid mud, and they could only move carefully along its edge. Eventually they were told to stop. They had apparently reached the commandant's dugout, and would have to wait until it was determined on which part of the front their gun would be set up. The police discovered that the gun team they were replacing had dug two holes to serve as shelters against the embankment wall and between the roots of some shattered trees. Still, the holes were not large enough to hold all of them. As they waited, the lieutenant chose Barthas and two other men to go back to the town of Comble to find the field kitchens and depots so they could bring back food and ammunition for the team the following day. And so, at 10 p.m., over 12 hours since their march from the Beaufray farm had started, Barthas and his two companions again headed out. It was dark, they were unfamiliar with the land, and they had no guides with them. They soon met a company that was heading to the rear lines, and, thinking that it must be heading towards Comble, started to follow it. Soon, Barthas noticed by some landmarks that they were heading in the wrong direction, and, when he asked the soldiers of the company, discovered that they were from another regiment and were heading to a place called the Thron Forest. They had never seen Comble. And so, Barthas and his two companions found themselves completely lost and alone in the middle of a deserted plain. They were resigned to simply spend the night right there and then, 
so as not to get even more lost. But suddenly, a battery of 75mm cannons started firing nearby. They approached it and met the guards of the artillery battery, who gave them directions to reach Comble. They followed the road towards the town. It was in a sad and muddy state, and on it was a long line of artillery wagons, many of which were stuck and sinking into the mud with double and triple teams of horses struggling miserably to try and pull them out. Barthas commented on how war was terrible for both men and beasts. They continued on their way, and at 1 a.m. finally reached the town of Comble. On the regular bombardment, the place was a ruin and looked almost completely deserted. The silence was only disturbed by the occasional horse artillery that galloped by. Completely exhausted, Barthas and his two companions decided to rest in the first shelter they could find. After some searching, they found in the middle of the ruins a small hole that led into a cellar under one of the few homes that was still standing. Happy with their luck and looking forward to the possibility of a few hours of sleep, the Apollos entered the hole, when they were hit with a terrible odor of rotting flesh that almost made them faint. They turned on their flashlights and, to their horror, found six dead Germans within that hole. It seemed they had been killed instantly by the explosion of some massive shell, as the corpses were frozen in poses so natural that it was as if they were still alive. The three Palus immediately fled that grave and looked for some other place to rest. They left behind the ruined village and suddenly came upon a long cylindrical shape that was coming out of the ground. As they approached to investigate, they discovered that it was one of their large artillery pieces that was in a bunker dug into the ground and covered with a camouflage tarpaulin. The gun was not being used and there was no crew in sight, probably resting in some other shelter. And so the three Palus snuck into the bunker and lay down on the gun's carriage. Barthas commented to his companions that they were like to run on the eve of battle, referring to a famous 17th century French general who as a youth had been found sleeping on a cannon platform. But his companions had never heard of Turenne. Who is he? Someone from the company? they asked. No, you imbeciles, replied Barthas. He was a famous and renowned general. But for his young companions, a general was only someone who sent people to kill each other. Oh, the bastard, they said. I hope he bit the dust. Then they all went to sleep. The night became so cold that they could feel the mud on their boots freezing and cracking. But their exhaustion was such that they didn't care and fell asleep anyways. At daylight they were woken up by an even sharper cold. Their feet were completely numb and it took them several minutes to finally manage to stand up. They looked around. Near the ravine where their battalion had assembled, they found some gun teams, but no one knew anything of where the field kitchens and supplies were located. They kept looking around and started obtaining pieces of information. It seemed that the field kitchens had been set up near the village of Comble the previous evening, but due to some heavy shelling which Barthas and his two companions had not heard in their exhausted sleep, the kitchens had been forced to withdraw during the night, to no one knew where. Someone suggested that it might have been the town of Morepa. They discovered that during that heavy shelling, the Periosal Louis Richardy, who cooked for Commandant Kansgram and for Captain Crow Mayreville, had had one of his comrades killed outright. They were also told that the 4th Machine Gun Company's field kitchen had been filled with holes, which did not spell well for Barthas and the others. Eventually, they reached the town of Morepin. Here one could not see a single brick, 
as it had all been taken by the territorials who used them to pave the roads at night. What one could see was a large mess of vehicles, wagons, and field kitchens in the center of town, but among these there was none belonging to the 296th Regiment. The three Palus had already finished all their rations. Martha's only food since their departure from the Pomfrey camp had consisted of a soggy piece of bread and a chocolate bar that had been transformed into paste by the rain. They were extremely hungry, and were also reminded of their hungry comrades back in the trenches, waiting anxiously for the food they were supposed to bring that evening. With nothing more they could do, Barthas and his two companions posted themselves at the side of the road, waiting for someone from their own regiment to pass by. Finally, to their great joy, they spotted an orderly from the 296th riding by on horseback and approached him. The orderly explained that the regiment's supplies and field kitchens had been sent to the nearby ruined town of Hardecourt. The police immediately set off and arrived there thirty minutes later, but soon noticed that the kitchens were nowhere to be seen. On the way there, they had gotten stuck in a part of the road where the mud reached up to their axles, and so the kitchens did not arrive there until much later in the evening. When the three Palus arrived at Hardecourt, they found a cellar that no longer had a house on it, and which was full of straw. Hardly believing their luck, the Palus immediately took up residence in it under the principle of first come, first served. A half hour later, a group of engineers arrived and ordered them out, claiming that the cellar belonged to a detachment they had just relieved. But Barthas told them that they were too late, and none of the three Palus budged. The engineers went out to look for their officers, but they could do nothing as the three Palus declared they would only leave that cellar by force. And due to the ruined village having nothing in the way of military policemen, they had to be left alone. So, for a short while, Barthas and his two companions could rest, sheltered from the rain, cold, and shells that fell on the city. Eventually, they met the field kitchens, and managed to go back to the trenches and resupply their comrades later during the night. At the beginning, they had difficulty spotting their team, but... As soon as they shouted out, 37 millimeter cannons, Sergeant Gauthier, their comrades quickly emerged from various holes. They'd not had anything to eat or drink in two days. But we shall have to see what happened after this on the next episode. For now, we have reached the end of this part of the 13th Notebook. There is not much to say. Barthas and the other Palus have now been sent into the Battle of the Somme, a battle that would last almost five months and claim well over a million casualties. The Palus have just arrived there, and there is much yet to be told about it. But for now, I will see you on the next episode, and I hope you all have a good day.